Welcome everyone to the Newburyport Literary Festival. My name is Jennifer Entwistle and I am the co-director of the festival. This is our 16th year of bringing authors and readers together and it is our biggest year yet. We have over a hundred panelists speaking today and tomorrow and there is something for everyone. So I hope you've all checked out the schedule and mapped out your events for the next two days. We are using Zoom webinar, which means that you'll be able to see the panelists, but we cannot see and hear the audience. So we do encourage you to use the chat mechanism on the side so that you can have a discussion about any points that we're making. Um, but if you do have questions for the authors, please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. And we will be taking questions for the authors later in the session. I want to thank um, A Mighty Blaze for partnering with us again this year. They uh, helped us go virtual last year, and we are currently live streaming this event to their Facebook page. So thank you to A Mighty Blaze. And my last bit of housekeeping is to ask that we support our local booksellers, especially today on Independent Bookstore Day. Uh, we have two uh, local independent booksellers that are partnering with us this year, Jabberwocky Bookshop here in Newburyport and the Bookshop of Beverly Farms. So once the session gets started, I will actually put links to those two bookshops into the chat window. Now, of course, if you have a favorite uh, local bookseller, then we encourage you to support them as well. So uh, just buy local from independent booksellers, please. Now, it is my honor to introduce our British mystery panel. Uh, we have Ellie Griffiths, who wrote four novels under her own name, Domenica De Rosa, before turning to crime with The Crossing Places, the first novel featuring forensic archaeologist Dr. Ruth Galloway, which was the winner of the Mary Higgins Clark Award. Her first standalone mystery, The Stranger Diaries, won the 2020 Edgar Award for Best Crime Novel. The Postscript Murders is her second standalone mystery. We also have Dorothy Coomson. She's the award-winning author of 15 novels, including the Sunday Times bestsellers, My Best Friend's Girl, The Ice Cream Girls, and Good Night, Beautiful. A TV adaptation based on The Ice Cream Girls was shown on ITV1 in 2013. After briefly living in Australia, Dorothy now lives in Brighton. And we have Ruth Ware. She has worked as a waitress, a bookseller, a teacher of English as a foreign language, and a press officer before settling down as a full-time writer. She's the number one New York Times and Globe and Mail best-selling author of In a Dark, Dark Wood, The Woman in Cabin 10, The Lying Game, The Death of Mrs. Westaway, The Turn of the Key, and One by One. She lives with her family on the south coast of England. And our moderator today is Lorna Ruby. She's been working in bookstores as a, as a started working in bookstores as a college student at Framingham State University in 1978 and went on to manage three bookstores for the former laureates chain before becoming a book buyer. She's been with Wellesley Books since 2003. She lives in North Attleboro, the town she grew up in, and listens to lots of books in her car on the way to work. Thank you for joining us. And Lorna, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm uh, here, we have a huge audience and I have to assume with this amazing uh, group of authors that we have people from all over. Um, I set up my little background today with, um, I can't even tell if anyone can see this, but all of your books are up here on my mantle, all of your latest books. Um, also a little bit of um, British things. I have a Brambley Hedge teacup and saucer over here. I went with the teacup theme because I certainly have been, um, while reading your books and any British novel, I feel like I just need a good cup of tea to go along with the story. Um, and I really am thrilled, absolutely thrilled to be um, speaking with you today. Um, I just want to reiterate what Jennifer said. Um, I have been reading these wonderful authors' um, books in preparation for today. And I have to say their latest books are absolutely fabulous. I want to encourage everyone, if you haven't already bought their um, books, please um, do that. And 
again, you can use your local favorite independent bookstore or do the links through the Newburyport Festival's um, stores, the Jabberwocky Books and the Bookshop of Beverly Farms. And it is an exciting day for independent bookstores being Independent Bookstore Day in America, um, where we're encourage everybody, especially in these difficult times, to um, go to your local bookstore and support them in any way that you can. Um, I want to start off today by saying that, um, talk about me. Um, I have a vivid memory of my very first mystery book, the book that I read as a child that totally hooked me on the genre. I'm going to share it with you because I actually have like a little weekly reader edition of it. It was called The Key to the Treasure and it's by Peggy Parrish, who's an American author who went on to fame. Um, she created the character Amelia Bedelia. I don't know if you would have heard of her, but um, it's absolutely fabulous. And what I loved about this book is because it was three cousins. They spend the summer at their grandparents' house and um, there is a mystery. There's a picture on the wall at their grandparents' house uh, that leads to a treasure. I don't even remember what the treasure is, but I just love the excitement, the kids using their brains to figure out what's going on, which totally hooked me. Um, and I've been a mystery reader ever since. So I wanted to ask the authors um, if, in fact, you do read mysteries, um, if, if you started as a child, um, and if not, was there something, some book in your past that sort of uh, made everything click for you um, and started you on this path? And I don't know if we should, I'm just somebody chime in, but I want to hear from all of you. Um, well, I, um, I'll, I'll go first. I um, I love that cover, by the way, Lorna. Oh, it's I beautiful. know. Yeah, so totally cool. cool. Totally and do you know cool. what? I, I have often wished that adult books, I mean, not adult books, our yes. books, books for grown-ups, were illustrated. Because wouldn't it be great to have illustrated mm -hmm. adult books? Adult yes. books, not adult books. Um, no, I'm the adult book buyer for my bookstore, so I totally get it. Yes. Okay, I'll stop doing that now. Yeah. Um. So, so the the book I I was just thinking when you were saying that I think the book that started me on the sort of mystery uh, genre was an actually Nina Blyton book, and uh, oh. when you think about it, I, I write at a children's book series, um, and I often go to schools and I say, "Have you read any crime novels?" And they all say no, and then I say, "Have you read any Nina Blyton?" And they all say yes because mm -hmm. they. They are crime novels obviously and of course now you've got some amazing mystery novels for children like sort of um Shana Jackson and uh, Robin Stevens and things but but um Ina Bryan was a mystery writer and she wrote a book called the Rillaby Fair mystery and that was had a really big effect on me it's, it's a very good little mystery it has a quite a creepy scene you'll have to take my word for this involving stuffed animals with their eyes their glass eyes glinting in the dark and, and it really did have an effect on me. I might even have used that glass eye scene, you never know. Um, and when I was 11, and I know Dorothy also wrote a book at a similar age, I read a book when I was 11 and it was called The Hair of the Dog, which must have been something my parents talked about. I don't know if I knew what it meant, but it must have been a phrase they used. And it was, it was a crime novel set in Rottingdean, which funnily enough, uh, we were talking earlier, Ruth, Dorothy and I all live quite close to each other on the South Coast, so they'll both know Rottingdean. It's set in Rottingdean, little village near me, where nothing much happened, but the, um, so the young people there decided to stage a fake murder, um, which turns into a real murder. So that was the book I wrote when I was 11. So I was already well onto the mystery path. Absolutely fabulous. Ruth, do you have a... Yeah, so, well, like Ellie, I started off with Enid Blyton, um, but I do remember reading my first Enid Blyton, and for anybody who hasn't read it, it's, um, I started off with Famous Five, which is uh, four kids, two boys and two girls, um, but the eldest kid is a boy, and he gets to boss everybody else around, and the eldest girl is called George, and spends her whole time wanting to be a boy because being a girl is rubbish, and saying things like, well, I'm almost as good as a boy, and the youngest child, Anne, literally gets to do nothing apart from make beds for the others, and tidy up their dens, and, you know, cook, she's occasionally allowed to cook things, 
Um, and I remember my mum saying at the end of the book, and, and and do you think it's fair that Anne didn't get to do very much? I mean, <laughs> like, no, I think it's rubbish. I think Anne should have been. So then after that, I graduated on to Nancy Drew, who was very much, you know, she was front and centre and the one bossing everybody else around. Mm. Um, also with a sidekick called George, weirdly. But no, you know, Nancy was very much the star of the show. Um, and I think maybe that sort of early disappointment with uh, with the role of women's kind of agency in Eden Blyton is maybe partly what um, keeps me putting women front and centre in my book. Certainly all my characters, all my main characters so far um, have been women. So, yeah, perhaps I owe it all to Eden Blyton on some level. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. How about you, Dorothy? I read... Uh, quite I used to read a lot when I was a child uh, so I, I read so much I remember reading a lot of Enid Blyton but I think the thing that really caught my imagination was Sherlock Holmes actually I oh. I remember the sign of four reading the sign of four and we're going oh my god it, it was so intricate and it was such a twist a couple of twists all along the way and I, I remember just loving them absolutely loving all of the Sherlock Holmes um books and then I watched them on television because when I was younger there was a adaptation which I think is the best with Jeremy Brett as the ah, as Sherlock Holmes yeah. and I loved it and I loved all the mystery stuff like that the, the stuff that you couldn't ever understand or work out because you were, all the elements were there at the beginning but you never saw them until right at the end when it was kind of like the ball turned on a on a uh, Penny's Edge almost so I think for me I mean I, I have read so many books and it's funny when somebody will bring up something and I'll go oh yeah I read that I remember reading that I don't remember reading it until someone brings it up so I, I must have read so many other mystery books mm. so I was also a big comic fan I'm a big sci-fi fan so I used to read a lot of J.G. Ballard and a lot of his books that had a mystery and it wasn't like the mystery of, of a murder but there'd be a, a kind of murder, but it'd be a sci-fi kind of element to it. And then the, again, the twist in the tale, which you didn't see coming at all. Yeah. And you did write a book when you were 13. I did. You, I wrote a book when I was 13. That was a mystery <laughs> book. It was a, it was a romance. Um, it was a romance completely set in America. Well, I've never been to America at that point. <laughs> and, um, it was about a girl uh, who had a twin brother. I don't have a twin brother. And who had... Um, this romance with a new kid in town and she got, didn't get on with her dad. Her mum had left. I mean, my parents were married forever. So, so it, none of it was related to my life, but I had this whole so imagination I that I created. I wrote a book when I was 12. I wrote a sort of thinly veiled rip off of, um, oh, uh, Earthsea woman, Ursula Le Guin. Oh, Ursula it was Guin, all yes. kind of fantasy Earthsea. sort of different realms. So. <laughs> They obviously all started young, but went off in like started in completely different places and then all yes. converged on. <laughs> um, Going back I, to it, yeah. I um, read something in Ellie's bio that I um, sort of have to admit to myself um, that Ellie said somewhere that she wrote a Starsky and Hutch episode. Now, believe it or not, Ellie. I too wrote a story, and I don't know if we're aging ourselves. I too, in my brain, I never wrote it down, but it, I totally had one worked out where my I and my best friend were going to be like female policemen, sort of like uh, Starsky and Hutch. And I had this thing that I thought about an awful lot, but I've never, I've never uh, wanted to write a story. Um, myself, but being a lifelong reader and a lifelong mystery reader, I'm always like fascinated. Like a lot of people say, oh, I figured it out. You know, I was in chapter two and I already figured out who did it. But I try not to do that. I enjoy the experience. I learn what I learn. And yes, I think about the characters, especially in all of your books. The characters are just so interesting and thoughtful and you you know get inside their heads I've enjoyed the experience thoroughly but I never I don't know whether I think I'm going to spoil it if I try to guess as I go along but other people that's the way they judge a mystery is when they figure out who did it and I don't know whether they feel like they're one-upping the author or not 
Um, but somebody actually has already put a question in the um, in the Q and A uh, that ties into this, um, and she asks, "Do you know your ending before you begin your story?" So, what do we think of that? Shall I never know the ending really. I have an idea, a vague idea. I remember with the Ice Cream Girls. The Ice Cream Girls was the first mystery emotional thriller that mm -hmm. I wrote. Crime heavy book that I wrote and I remember I had the idea of two women who had both been accused of the same crime when they were teenagers and one of them went to prison and one of them got away with it as it were and then 20 years later they're reunited and um and one of them seeking revenge and I didn't know who which one of them had done it because they both had really valid reasons to to kill Marcus the mm -hmm. um the guy who they who who was who was their teacher who basically groomed them into a relationship and then was abusive to them and so I just thought I'll, I'll start writing I'll start writing it'll come to me and as I got to know Serena and Poppy I realized who which one of them it had to be so so no I don't really know because yeah. I you know you get to know the characters as you go along I'm not one of those authors who plots everything out because I know lots of people do and I probably my life would probably be a lot easier if I did actually sit down and plot it all out, but I just, I leave it to finding out who, who did it as, a, as time goes on. Although sometimes I do, I don't write in order. So I write, sometimes I do start at the end, but it's never the ending that I started with, if that makes sense. I, I'll go back and write the beginning, then the middle, then stitch it all together. And um, by that point, the ending is completely different. And the person who's done it is usually completely different as well. Wow. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not a big plotter. I don't plot out like every detail or anything because I'm always impressed with these authors who have, you know, like every sort of chapter planned at the beginning. And I, I find I can't work um, like that. But unlike Dorothy, I usually pretty much always know who done it. Um, and I think maybe that's because of the way I structure my books. I sort of try to go for quite an Agatha Christie-ish type thing where it's sort of a bit of a puzzle and part of the like not all of my books are like this some of them are more why done it or how done it um but the sort of who done it element and the puzzly element is a big part of my books and i sort of have to have those building blocks in place before i start because often the whole plot or the whole reveal hinges on a couple of moments that i have to get right and unless i know what those are beforehand it's very difficult to sort of plot around them and make sure they work um, but I don't, I, so I almost always know who done it. I usually know how and why, but that's generally it. Everything else, like how the plot unfolds, what happens along the way, sometimes who's killed and when, um, certainly how it's discovered. That's often my biggest challenge is I know what's happened, but I have to somehow make somebody <laughs> in the book figure it out without, because it's not very satisfying if you just sort of drop the solution in their lap. You know, you don't want someone yeah. sending an anonymous note with a vital clue or something. You have to have them figure it out. And sometimes I find I've tied things up so well that it's almost impossible for them to figure it out because the, the killer has covered their tracks so fantastically um and that so that that's usually what I find out as I go along I find out how my character solves the mystery so I guess it's sort of a little bit Columbo in that sense in the not that that's how my books are structured but you know the way with Columbo you know who the killer is at the beginning and the fun for the viewer is figuring out how Columbo is going to bring them to rights. So I guess for me as a writer, that's sort of how I experience my books. I know who did it. And the puzzle for me is figuring out how I'm going to weave that through, how I'm going to mislead the reader and how my characters are going to figure it out. Oh, great, great. That's the, the thing about Columbo saying, is it just one more thing. At the <laughs> I've never used that in my books, but maybe I should. Perhaps that will be my challenge. Yes, but... yes, I'll watch out for that in the next book. One more book. thing. I think we should all do that. And our next books, we should all go, just one more thing. <laughs> yes. Yes, 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 let's do, do that at the end. <laughs> or the bit where the detective, I really don't, neither of you have ever done this, where the, de the, the, the detecting character says, I know who did it, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> no, say, for goodness sake. Oh, you know, we all need to know. But 
I guess I'm I'm really really interested listening to you two talking. It's I suppose it's a little bit similar to me. I'm not a huge plotter. I'm not a spreadsheet person or anything. But it has changed for me actually. So I've written I think 22 books as Ellie Griffiths. Um, and I always used to write a little like in longhand in my notebook, like a chapter plan, like one line for each chapter. But I would go through to the end and I would know who did it, really. Um, and I would obviously vary from this plan, but um, it was there. But for the last my last four books, so I think Stranger Diaries, Postscript Murders, The Night Hawks and The Lantern Men, I haven't had a written plan. And I don't quite know why that's happened. And actually, they are definitely my four most complicated plots. I mean, The Stranger Diary has, has a, an event seen from three different viewpoints and it has, has sort of literary clues and things and so does Postscript Murder. So somehow I managed to hold that into my head without a written plan. And there's a really good thing that somebody said. I think it was E.L. Doctorow. He said um, that writing a book was like driving in the dark with your headlights on. Uh, you could you could only see the little way in front of you, but you could do the whole journey that way. And I guess that's how it is with me now. Now I only see it bit by bit, but I guess I sort of trust that I will get there. So now my process is a lot more fluid, um, but I think the books are actually themselves a bit tighter plotted. So I don't quite know how that's happened or if that's going to go on happening, but for the moment that, that's how I'm working with, with no written plan, but with a kind of vague idea of where I'm going. That's amazing. Um, I do want to say that um, I feel like I should do a, a general shout out to the very smart American publishers who have brought uh, your great books over to um, America because uh, there, you know, there's always a difference uh, between the American and the um, the British publisher, and it's the rights that are sold off. So. Um, Ellie is be, is books are mostly Houghton Mifflin Harcourt in America. Um, Dorothy's uh, latest book is uh, Quirkus in America, which is distributed by Hachette. And uh, Ruth, ha all of your books have been from Simon and Schuster, their gallery imprint. And um, you know, the gist of this uh, talk is sort of about how much Americans love um, British mysteries. Um, I know I've had um, exposure to everything British that I totally love um, through TV, through, you know, uh, Masterpiece Theater in America shows all the Agatha Christie movie editions. Um, and even more contemporary authors are being done. Um, Kate Atkinson's uh, Jackson Brody, um, I think, um, and a few of you, I think Dorothy and Ruth have had either TV options or movie options. And I would love, personally love to see any of Ellie's books made into movies. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, and so I think that's been a nice entry. Um, so what do you, uh, are there TV movie kind of things, introductions in the works to, um, of any of your works right now? I know. Um, what, me? Well, yeah. um, my books are under option and they, they have been optioned three times for, for TV yeah. and haven't made it on TV. Um, so they haven't missed it. They weren't there. Yeah. So I guess I hope they will. You know, every time there's a new option, you do hope. And there's always, you know, and I know, I know Dorothy's had the Ice Cream Girls on TV and be really interested to hear about that. Um, and I know, I know uh, Ruth's had lots of interest too. So it, it's kind of great at first because they're really excited and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I can see Kate Winslet being Ruth. No, they, they don't say that, but that's just an example. But actually, I do remember the very first time they were optioned and I went to meet um, with the person who was going to option them. And the very first thing he said to me, which slightly put my back up was he said, oh yeah, he said, um, I've solved the problem of your books. So I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> Right. And he he like, I wasn't I've aware there was a I've problem. I've solved the problem of your book, Sally. Yes, he said, um, I've got rid of Cathbad. Um, she's not an archaeologist anymore. I haven't set them in Norfolk. And I was, it, it was really shocking. And basically, he got rid of the problem of my books by turning them into someone else's books. And really. getting rid of your books. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, which was really my first experience of that. And, and I did, um, I did sort of, 
I didn't say anything then and there, but afterwards I was with my agent and we were in a little cafe, um, like the Losers Cafe on The Apprentice. I know you have The Apprentice there too. Um, so we're in the Losers Cafe of The Apprentice. And I said to my agent, we've got to say no, we've got to turn this down. And she said, she did say yeah. And then I sort of got my high horse and I said, oh, you know, it's because it's because I have a, um, not in, I wasn't entirely not true this, but I was saying I have a responsibility to my readers and I have, you know, I have my integrity and I'm going to make a stand. And then I said, Rebecca, you tell him. So she had to go back and tell him. So, uh, you know, that was my first kind of experience of that. And that didn't go anywhere. But, you know, there's, there's a new company interested now and they seem to have really good people. So you never know, as, as we were saying earlier, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Ruth, every time I read one of your books, I can picture... I think a lot of people in their heads, they cast the p characters as they're reading along, um, but there's nothing imminent, imminent, imminent for you right now. No, I mean, they, they've pretty much all been optioned one way or another, some for yeah. telly, some for film, yeah. and some as long shots, some as or long form, maybe. I mean, some as like, you know, single, but nothing has started filming yet. And um yeah, I'm sort of, I would love to see it happen, but at the same time, it kind of as Ellie's story <laughs> illustrated, I guess you are handing your baby over to someone else. So there's yeah. that kind of like, you know, my baby's going off to kindergarten sort of feeling where you're, you want it to happen and you're so excited, but at the same time, it's a bit kind of, oh, is it going to be okay? So uh, yeah, so we'll see. If it happens, it happens. I'll be really happy. Um, but yeah, no, nothing on the horizon sort of imminently. Yeah. So they'd Dorothy, all be brilliant. They'd all be brilliant, Ruth. I can just imagine them. Imagine oh, the yeah. house in the death of Mrs. Westaway and the, the I amazing think they're very boat. cinematic. I know I'm biased. <laughs> I, I do. I think they're so cinematic. And the boat it, it doesn't deserve to be called more than a boat, you know, the woman in, in cabin 10. I, I can see it, as, as Lorna said. But Dorothy's yeah. the only one that's crossed the finishing line. So yeah, she, yeah. Has, she has to tell us what it's like. Was it right. all it was cracked up to be? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, if you know. Oh such a long time ago now isn't it and I've kind of I've got over it now you blanked um, out you know what it's funny um but it's not funny it's funny listening to you talking Ellie about um about oh yeah I've solved the mist I've solved the problem they didn't actually tell me they'd solved the problem in my book until they were about to start filming and then they told me they'd solved all the problems with the ice cream girls um so they changed the killer they changed the ending they changed half of the characters they'd um they turned two girls who'd been groomed by this guy into two vixens who basically seduced it yeah seriously it was just uh, wow that wouldn't fly that these days would I, it <laughs> i know <laughs> no it wouldn't and that was the uh, you know it was really it was what you said earlier about you have a responsibility to your readers that was what broke my heart about it i didn't care about changing the ending because you know I can understand all that but the way they changed it and the fact that because the ice cream girls is at its heart and uh, sort of exploring the idea of abuse and what we knew abuse to be it was so much more than just physical abuse it was emotional abuse and psychological and the whole grooming element which was something that I'd worked very hard to kind of put across that it was literally it could be any of us. And that was all erased from the Ice Cream Girls. Um, now I can look back and go, well, actually they, I, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. They read the story and saw in it something that they expected to see, not what I had actually written. So it wasn't the best experience at the time, but from that, I met Nicholas Pinnock who played one of the characters in, um, in the Ice Cream Girls, he played Dr. Okay, there's a little hiccup. Um, I'm All right, Dorothy, I'm gonna. And I'm gonna. He is now his other books so you know something good if i don't write it for anything other than being a book you know yeah. it's fantastic if it sorry my internet connection's not good apparently yeah. um but i write um 
a book because I want to tell the story in book form. And if anything comes from it, fantastic. You know, that's the ice yeah. on the cake. Yeah, yeah. But for me, it's just about telling that story in book form because I love books more than more than anything. I mean, I love te- television. I'm not going to pretend I don't. Yeah. I love television. I love movies. But books yeah. are the top. Right, right. Well, as a bookseller, um, I have to say that um, I really do think that, uh, well, we always say uh, read the book and see the movie. Um, because the book is always, always better. And, um, but I do feel like, especially in this world of Netflix and, and the p- pandemic, that a lot of people watching things, it makes them want to, you know, they want to go back to the original to figure out what did they cut out, because you know that they cut things out. And I'm going to hold up your book, because I have to say, I love this title, All My Lies Are True. And it is a sequel in uh, somewhat to the ice cream girls now this is what I have read and it's very powerful and very interesting and um just the what goes on in these characters minds it's it's just um kind of devastating and I actually haven't had a chance to read the ice cream girls yet um but I still thoroughly enjoyed this one um yeah and so do you feel like your background in psychology sort of filters through in in um, in what you're writing with your characters? For me, it's it's more about my interest in people. I've always been fascinated by people yeah. and the things they do and why they do them and the fact that people will say one thing and then do something completely different, which yeah. is why I started I studied psychology because I was always I always wanted to know what was behind that and why where that came from. And so writing books, obviously. It's, it's a great way of getting to speak to people because I speak to a lot of people I talk to them hear their stories so that I can be as authentic as possible when I'm telling the story so it's um it's I think my interest in psychology comes from my interest in people and yeah. my interest in people kind of informs the books that I write and I'm always fascinated I mean, I'm properly fascinated by people and the things that they do and why they do them and you know, as Ruth said earlier on about why done it. I, I, I think I find that the most fascinating part of why someone has done it, and that's why my books aren't focused so much on who committed the crime, more as in why they committed the crime and the effect it has on the internal and external lives of everybody around the crime. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, so I, um, I. I've read a lot of your books leading up to this, and for the most part, they're contemporary stories, contemporary characters, con- contemporary settings. Although I have to shout out to um, El- one of Ellie's series. Um, I read the first Zigzag Girl, the Max Mephisto series, and I am absolutely loved it. Um, it's a great book to hand sell because of the elements um, I'll let you talk about it a little bit. I mean, and it's not history, historical or anything. It's just like 1950, but um, the, uh, how did you, I, I, I feel like I've read enough about you that there's a little bit of your background in the story, but these Max Mephisto books are absolutely fabulous. Well, um, thank you. That's so yeah. sweet of you. Yeah. Do you know, though, I'm going to tell you something that, something that shocked me. Um, I think will shock all of us. In order to qualify for getting the historical dagger, which is the dagger for the best historical mystery, your book can be set in 1980. What? <laughs> so, oh 1980. <laughs> Kids. Oh, yesterday. Yeah. That's very upsetting. I know, I know. I'm really upsetting. Really to me too, but <laughs> 1980 is, is you know... Those Starsky and Hutch stories. That's history, We're all historical know. artifacts. I know, I know. I yes. don't like to be the one to break it to you. So, so these books are set in, the first one is The Zigzag Girl. It's set in 1950 and it's yeah. set in the world of, um, here in Britain we would say musical. I think you might say vaudeville. Yeah. So it's sort of, you know, tr- um, variety shows that sort of travelled around the country. Yeah. And, and really that was set because um, my granddad was in that world. I'm just going to get, Pick something from my notice board, which um, is just here. There's a picture of him. There he is. So that's my grandfather. He was called uh, Dennis Laws, and he was a a comedian. He was sort of fairly famous between the wars as a comedian. And his life was sort of travelling around, going to 
different town every week, you know, one week he'd be in Glasgow, and he'd be in Manchester, and then he'd be in sort of Southampton, and he would, would perform with these different shows. And and um, when he died, I was very close to him. He died when I was 15. He left me his playbills. And, um, mm. oh, my goodness, you should see the names on them. They're things like um, Lou Lenny and her unrideable mule. <laughs> You know, what's all that about? Um, uh, Lavanda's Feats with the Feet, Ray Dini, the Gay Deceiver. You know, I don't know who Ray Dini was, but I really wanted to write about these people. So this is a series that's um, the Brighton Mysteries, I guess they're called now. Um, and they're set in that world and they're about a magician called Max Mephisto, who is slightly based on a real life magician called Jasper Maskelin, who um, I don't know if anyone's heard of him, but it's a very interesting story that in the Second World War, Jasper Maskelin was asked by church to uh, set up a group of magicians to use magic tricks for the war effort. That's crazy. So, and they called themselves the Magic Gang. Yeah. And they did things like they used sleight of hand and camouflage and all those sort of skills. So they, they made dummy tanks and dummy soldiers. They used lights to make the Suez Canal disappear. So that was all true. So that is the backstory to, to Max Mephisto in my book, who's a magician. And in these in these stories, he teams up with a, with a police officer called Edgar Stevens, who he served within the war, who's based in Brighton. And the first is about a body that's cut into three that reminds Max of that trick, the zigzag girl, where the girl, and I'm afraid it almost always was a girl, goes into a cabinet and the swords go in and the middle bit's pulled out and it makes that zigzag shape. Mm. And it reminds him of that trick. But the funny thing is, though, um, the sixth book in the series comes out later this year in, in the US and, and in the UK, and it's called The Midnight Hour. But as the series has gone on, I'm in 1965 now, and the women characters have all come to the fore. So it's mainly now about two women detectives, although it's the same series. So it's really interesting how that's worked out. So uh, I'm so glad you like that book, Lorna. Yeah, Thank you. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so that brings up uh, uh, my favorite mystery authors that actually happen to be women. Very happy to have a group of very uh, good female writers here. And so do you, I mean, mostly it's strong female characters. I love the female detectives figuring things out. Um, do you make a conscious decision that that's the direction that you're going to go in with? Um, I mean, you, I'm sure all of you have a little bit, you, Ellie, have more male characters sort of driving the, the bus, as it were, um, than the they others. They don't often get to drive. Sometimes they yeah. get to sit in the passenger seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I've always been attracted to strong uh, female characters, though. And so is that where you're, as writers, you make this decision, uh, you... I've also heard this writer say this, does this happen to you, that the character fully formed popped into your head one day and that's how the story got started. Um, if you'd care to talk about that kind of thing, that'd be great. I don't know if I, I don't think it's a conscious decision for me. I think I've always been talking about kind of, most of my books tend to come from sort of fears or paranoias or phobias of my own. And I guess because I'm not that any of my characters are me but you know they will probably have a pinch of me in them even the really horrible ones mm. um, maybe mostly the really horrible ones um, and so I guess because I'm approaching it from that level it just tends to start out imbued with a sort of female perspective on the world you know a lot of my books are about things that I think <clears throat> are horrible for anybody but are particularly a feature of of being a woman in the 21st century you know like the woman in cabin 10 is basically about the fear of what if you see something you report it faithfully to the police or to the authorities and you're not believed and you know that came about from watching so many cases unfold in the news and on social media where it was a he said she said case and the more I watched the news the more it seemed to me that certain types of evidence from certain types of people were prioritized more highly and unfortunately very often a young drunk woman's evidence was considered to be at the bottom of the pile in terms of reliability and that's really what that book is about it's about someone saying giving their testimony and not being believed because of who they are um but no I don't think I don't think I sort of sat down and said I shall write about what it means to be a woman and I shall put women at the center of my books it's kind of just 
how it's um yeah sort of how just the ideas for the plots that have come to me so far have tended to be sort of female centric ones but I definitely wouldn't rule out having a male main character yeah yeah I did see Ruth walking towards me out of the mist actually fully formed uh when I was walking Ruth not me Ruth not you I always see Ruth every day (laughs) as I walk through Lewis now I'm looming out out of the (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, see Ruth and Dorothy. Actually, I, I did see Dorothy suddenly appear in Waterstones in Hove in front of me. And it was a very nice experience too. Um, but my character, Ruth, did suddenly appear to me sort of fully formed. Um, but that's never happened to me again. That's only been that one time when I, I was actually walking across Marshland in Norfolk and she did kind of appear to me. Uh, but that's never happened since. So, um, but I think it has, it is quite a conscious decision of mine to, to try and give women, you know, agency in my books and to make sure that, you know, uh, you know, the old Ed, Ed Shell test, and I know how to pronounce that, you know, that when two women talk to each other, there are always scenes where they talk to each other, not about men, you know, and it's surprising how many things don't still pass that test, really. So that, that is a bit of a conscious decision. And as I was saying with, with the um, uh, Brighton Mysteries, you know, to, to now have sort of the women be, be the leading characters in it, that, that does feel like, like something I, I kind of wanted to do, really. But yes, I do, do have sort of male point of view characters as well, Nelson, in, in the, the Ruth Galloway book, certainly. And he certainly does think he's in the driving seat, Lorna, because he loves driving, so. Uh, oh. <laughs> I, um, I, um, I always wanted to write books that had featured women who looked like me, because there were so few of the books that I like to read um, who, well, there weren't any. I couldn't find any that were, especially British books, that had black women at the centre who were like all different types of women, had different types of adventures. I mean, I started off writing romantic comedies and moved on to making people cry. And then now I move on to making people scared. So, you yeah. know, I've gone through the whole range of human experiences and things. But yeah, I just wanted to put people who look like me and who had experiences like me that were the universe experience at the heart of my stories. So um, I suppose in that way, it is conscious. It's not a conscious thing in that I don't write about men because um, marshmallows for breakfast, there's a part of it that is told from a male's point of view. Um, The ice cream girls, the end is told from a male's point of view. The, um, what was it? Women in Love Before, part of that book is told from a male's point of view, but it is about the women. The books are about the women. And like Ruth says, their experiences of the world and the things that happen to you because you are a woman and because you are socialized as a woman. Um, so it's conscious in one way, but not in another. Because that, And also those are the things I find fascinating. Those are the things that I, I want to pick up a book and you know, I want to pick up Ellie's book. I want to pick up Ruth's books because I know I'm going to get a certain type of character. I'm going to learn about their experiences of the world. Um, so that's the sort of stuff that interests me to read and also the stuff that interests me to, to write about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have to say in your book, the perspective of the children of the two female characters um, just uh, was so interesting, their experience, uh, what the mothers wanted their kids' experience to be based on what they had lived through. I mean, it's very powerful. Um, I just really found it um, interesting to read and um, uh, I just need to tell everyone they have to pick up. And do you feel like they need to read Ice Cream Girls first or they can just start like I did with All My Lies Are True? I actually wrote All My Lies Are True, so it could be a standalone, so you don't have yes. to read The Ice Cream Girls. Exactly. I also wrote it in a way that I didn't want to spoiler The Ice Cream right. Girls, so it was really yeah. hard, really, really hard. I don't know yeah. how you do it, Ellie, constantly write in a series because, my God, it was really difficult. But I, I made sure it was a book that you could read on its own and never pick up The Ice Cream Girls. But if you wanted yeah. to go back and read The Ice Cream Girls, you could without thinking, oh, yeah, well, I know what's going to happen because you're not actually ever sure. No, from reading all my lives are true so you will get an enjoyment from reading all my lives are true as a standalone book but yeah. also from reading the ice cream girls afterwards yeah Actually, no I, I agree I, I want to give a shout out to the brighton mermaid by dorothy as well which is a fantastic book about brighton and has a really really good 
group of characters who I thought about for ages afterwards. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you said that. Oh, thanks, Ellie. You're so lovely. You're so nice. And so are you, Ruth. You're both lovely. Oh, you're all just fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Um, I am going to switch over to asking some audience questions because I know as a participant in these things, um, uh, they've been watching all along. They've thought of things and um, they always feel disappointed. I always feel disappointed if my question doesn't get asked. Um, and the first one is, um, uh, is a really interesting one. Is it hard to write something that is sad or bad for your heroine? How do you feel about that? Oh, I put my characters through so much. I put them through hell. That's why <laughs> I don't usually write sequels um, because I've put them through utter hell to get to the end and then to come back and do it to them again. That's why the Ice Cream Girls was unusual in that because, you know, they had been yeah. through hell and then yeah. they came back for more. But no, I have no problem with it. It's telling the story. Yeah. I'm sorry, the I'm blind, like that. The blindfolded, Dorothy. Oh, oh. So, <laughs> so much. I know. I'm, I am actually quite evil. No, I have no problem <laughs> with it. I have to say that now. No problem. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do write a good baddie as well. <laughs> you do. So do you two. Don't pretend it's just me. You two do as well. <laughs> I'm quite no, we wouldn't dream of it. It's true. No, it's true. I, I, there's certain places that I wouldn't go in my imagination just because I don't want, you know, it takes the best part of a year to write a book. And I, there's some places I just don't want to spend a year researching and lurking around corners of the internet that I would really rather did not exist so there I, there's some things that I wouldn't do to my characters um but no I don't I'm pretty mean to them um I don't feel much remorse I feel like it's not me doing this this makes me sound like a psychopath doesn't it <laughs> it's out of yeah. my hands yes thank <laughs> me. I do have to, there's certain scenes that I have to take a kind of mental deep breath before I write. And often it feels like procrastination, but I know it's not. And particularly like for those people who've read it, the ending of the turn of the key is a really brutal scene. And I kind of procrastinated and procrastinated and procrastinated and kept being like, I'll definitely, I'll definitely write that chapter tomorrow. And I knew what was going to happen, but I sort of just had to kind of G myself up to do it. And then once I wrote it, I wrote it in like 20 minutes. And it was like, okay, it's done. I've been horrible to everyone. <laughs> I, I do think you're really good as well, Ruth, at making us feel physically the things your characters feel. I think it's in Mrs. Westaway where how how she never has warm enough clothes no. <laughs> and she's so cold at that funeral. And I was just reading that. I felt because she she buys a dress, I think, but it's it's sort of cheap, so it's cold. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, you're very There's good. There's usually at the one pretty... thing my characters want and can't get, and in the woman in cabin ten, it's sleep. She can't get to sleep, and in oh. in a dark dark wood, she spends the whole book wanting a decent cup of coffee, and she doesn't get <laughs> right. it until literally the penultimate page. Because I'm not a tea drinker. It was so funny when you said that, Laura, at the beginning. Oh. I, I, at all but people are always because I'm British are always like oh I've made you a nice cup of tea <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I empathize with that I like tea as well but I empathize with I don't know just thinking listening to you talk and Dorothy you were saying about series I do think it's kind of harder to put a series character through it um and so I've now written 13 books about Ruth and I'm writing the 14th Ruth obviously not about our Ruth where about Ruth Galloway so I'm I've written 13 books about Ruth Galloway um and I'm writing the 14th now and I guess she has been through a lot if you look at it you know consecutively but but it kind of it is difficult I think and I think now I do find it quite hard when when bad things happen to, to Ruth as they sometimes do because I have been with her so long I do think I have found it easier with the standalones in Postscript Murders is a sort of standalone that features the, the detective Harbin Decor from um, mm -hmm. Stranger Diaries. Um, it is kind of easier for me, anyhow, with the standalone too. And also I think people reading it as well, they're not quite sure which way you're going to jump. I think people assume that I won't let anything too awful happen to Ruth, but you never know how ruthless and, and going by Dorothy and Ruth, that's quite ruthless. Uh, you can ruthless, <laughs> you can be in, in a in a standalone. Yes. Well, I do have to say somebody did have a question about um, about writing a series versus a standalone, but I do feel like 
Ellie has so many series going and even your last standalone became then another, uh, which is your new book, The Postscript Murders. If I haven't said the titles of your books often enough, I, if that, I feel like that's on me. Because again, everybody, they're all fabulous. You have to read them all. Um, but I, I particularly enjoy the humor, Ellie, that you drop into your characters' mouths. I have found myself laughing out loud, which you don't normally do read when you're reading a thriller or a, a mystery that doesn't usually happen. Um, and it must come from you naturally. And I'm just gonna give one hysterical example. And I have a bunch that are just stuck in my mind, but in back in Mac, Max, Mephisto goes out to dinner with two of his old MI5 colleagues. And um, they ask the vaudeville theaters um, uh, orchestra director for uh, a recommendation because uh, they're at a in a town they don't know uh, they don't know and when they get there they he realizes of course that the food is horrible but the music is fabulous <laughs> just I just um, I think everybody uh, people come into the bookstore and say well I want I like mysteries but is there anything you know lighter and it, it's kind of hard to do a, little, a balance because you do have to write about, you know, somebody dies or something horrible happens. But um, the I find all of your main characters are so interesting in and of themselves that it's sort of the, the background of what's going to happen to them or what the actual mystery is. Uh, it's just that, that's the bonus. It's what you go there for, but you get totally enthralled in your characters, which, um, well, it's it's what as a reader you just love to come across. Um, so somebody has, uh, somebody wants to know how, Ellie, it is your um, pen name, how did you settle on the pen name of um, Ellie Griffiths? It was my grandmother's name. So oh. my real name, my real name is Domenica de Rosa, which yes, is yes. Italian. My dad was Italian and it does sound made up. You know, it yeah. does sound made up. But my friends, Ruth and Dorothy, would call me Dom. You know, my friends you know, always call me Dom. But, and I wrote four books as Domenica de Rosa, but when I wrote a crime novel, my agent told me to get a crime name. So I chose um, Ellen Griffiths, which was my grandmother's name. Somewhere along the line, it became Ellie. And I don't quite know what, how. And I did once ask my editor, and she said, oh, she said, uh, I think it looked a bit tidier. So there you are. Oh, there you are. Here's another question for everyone. Um, are you under a contract to produce a book once a year um, or every other year? How does that work? Um, and if so, uh, do you have trouble coming up with plots on demand? What uh, And do you get writer's block? I, I have a, usually have a two book deal, which is it involves a book a year and I've been doing that for 17 years or 16 years or whatever. I know Ellie Domenica has been doing it for since the, the dawn of time. And I can't believe how many books you've written. And you, and you, um, but it is my job. And that's the thing. I think Ruth and Ellie will both agree. It is your work and it is your job and you do it. You have to do it. It's not like any other job. You have to turn up. You have to do it. You can't sort of have a day off. You can't say, oh, actually, do you know what? I don't feel like it today you have to turn up, you have to show up and you have to produce your best. And so that is always how I've seen my work. It is an art form and it is a craft and I love what I do, but I always, at the back of my mind, think of it as a thing that makes how I make my living and how I have to do it. And I have to do it to the best of my ability. Like I've always done every other job I've, I've had, apart from being a receptionist, which I was terrible at and people constantly reminded me of. But other than that, you know, you have to, <laughs> You have to you have to put up you have to show up you have to show up really well that's what i think that's how i oh, we're slowing down managed to produce a book a year and ruth you've um since you've been introduced to american audiences it, feels like is it has it been a book a year it has been a book year in fact this yeah. year's the first well next year will be the first year that I have not done a book oh it's principally down to the lockdown 
Um, so yeah, like Dorothy, <clears throat> I've always done two book contracts. Uh, so I've always signed up for a book that I knew what it was about and a book that I don't know what it's about. Um, so that does always, and that's actually, that's always why I've resisted signing up for more because it is a bit scary sort of, you know, promising that you'll be writing a book in three years when you have no idea what that book will be about. And I think may, maybe, maybe Ellie will talk a bit about this, um, but perhaps with series characters that's easier because you know that you won't have to reinvent the wheel each time and you've sort of got that structure I don't know um but for me because I I only write standalones I've always sort of not wanted to kind of overcommit myself um but no I haven't I haven't had writer's block I mean I've had days when I don't feel like it but I completely agree with Dorothy it's my job and I have to turn up and I have to write whether or not I feel like it and, you know, sometimes I'll be ahead of myself and I'll think, oh, do you know what? I'm going to go off and do some research or I'm going to do my taxes or I'm going to go on social mm -hmm. media or do other parts of what it means to be an author these days. Yeah. But for the most part, I treat it like a job and I sit down in my chair at 9 a.m. and I don't get up until 3 p.m., which is when my kids come home. Um, but the pandemic has been <laughs> a killer, you know, for yeah. lots of people. Um, but I have youngish kids, they're school age, they emphatically couldn't do homeschooling by themselves. So basically, this year was more or less lost to yeah. doing worksheets and spelling and science and all the other things. Um, so mad respect to anyone else out there who has yeah. been dealing with this. I'm very lucky that I was able to put my work onto the back burners for a little bit and that I had understanding publishers. I know an awful lot of people who didn't have that luxury and who had a very, very difficult year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hats off to you for doing that. I, my kids are, are grown up and at university, I'm, which is why I did still do a book. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have. But yeah, I, I've written two books a year for the last few years. And absolutely just to, I know we haven't got much time left, but just to agree with what, you know, my friends have said, you know, it is a job and you have to sit down there. And I think that there was a question, I just had a look in the chat. I think it was the wonderful Hank Philippa Ryan, who's such a great oh, writer. Yes. Who, she that. mentioned something that I said in one of my books, which is the muse catches you working. And I just think that that's how it is. You, you sometimes have to sit down to start a book, even if you don't have an idea. And a bit as, as, as Ruth was saying, you sign two books, one you've got an idea about, and one you really, you yeah, just, yeah, you're like lucky it. if you can think of, a, you know, a few sentences to say about it, usually ending dot, 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 because you can't think what happens. And then there's a massive twist, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Um, so you just have to hope, you know, be professional and sit at your computer and hope that the muse arrives. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, so, I noticed that. Um, Hank, uh, Hank Philippi Ryan, of course, writes mysteries. Um, she is a Boston local author. Um, I'm afraid we are going to be out of time and I won't be able to get any more questions in, but I haven't said the title of Ruth Ware's most recent book, of course, is One by One. It's fabulous. And there was a comment. There's been lots of fabulous comments. Um, one of them was, does that app really exist? And, and how great was it that you came up with all these wacky names for the, um, the, the, the company uh, executives um, that get you know put away one by one in this mystery, which was absolutely fabulous. Um, they, uh, yeah, I really appreciate all the, the in, just talking with you guys. I'm sure we could talk for another hour or two, um, but I feel like Jennifer's gonna pop in at any second now and say we're done because um, the next, she has to handle the next session because my yeah, clock is turned I am, well. I am here, okay. Lorna, I'm here to Thank you. break in. So yeah. I know my, when my face comes on, everybody's sad because it means it's over. Yeah. Um, so. This has been an amazing session and there are so many questions that we couldn't get to. We could have done an entire hour just answering all these questions. I do want to give a shout out. One of them is an eighth grade student. So I think yes. that's about 13, 14. So yeah. future writer, I think, saying they love crime and mystery and, and they're asking about your biggest inspiration. So can I give you each like 30 seconds? But let's answer this, this future writer's question. What's your, your inspiration that led you to writing? Um, Wilkie Collins and Victorian, Victorian literature. Yeah, writing books that I wanted to read. So they weren't there, so I made them. I made them for myself. 
exploring my own fears I always think my books are like free therapy for me <laughs> <laughs> excellent oh thank you so much and uh someday we're going to have that future writer in the festival I think Yay. Uh, Yay. so anyway Good thank luck you to them. so much for joining us this has been an incredible session uh, I I just appreciate so much having you all here so um I hope to the audience we're going to see you at some other sessions and have a great rest of your day thank you it was Bye. wonderful to meet you all.